Welcome to Five Strike Weekly, everyone. This week, we break down that win against the Colorado Rapids, and we also preview both matches against San Jose Earthquakes and Real Salt Lake. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Strike Fam. I'm AJ, this is Tanner McLeod. Before we get into it, become a member of the Notification Squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button. So guys, let's get into that win against Colorado on Saturday, and it was a 3-0 rout of the Rapids. And we saw Miggy score a brace. We saw Gressel with two assists. We also saw Tito get on the score sheet as well, and that's always good. And uh, Joseph could have scored his 29th, but he laid it off instead and got an assist. But uh, it was one of those wins that uh, pretty comprehensive, but that second half kind of dead. And uh, but it does uh, prove that you know our consistency this season after dropping points, 10 wins and one draw. I mean, that's just uh, really, really good. Yeah, absolutely. I think the first thing for me is the fact that Colorado were absolutely terrible. Yeah. That was honestly a shambles of a team. And the as tactics. Far, as far as a ridiculous. professional performance, I don't know what I was watching. Yeah, the tactics were terrible. They tried pressing Atlanta. That didn't work. I mean, it was just all around terrible from Colorado. Atlanta United took care of business. You know, 3 0 in the first half, comprehensive. Game was killed. I mean, there was no way Colorado was getting back in. Yeah, they had shots and some chances, but they never put them on target. And honestly, for me, never looked like scoring. Mm -hmm. Atlanta could have had more. I think LGP had a goal that definitely should have stood. It should have been four 0 But I mean, hey, three points is three points. I was right in my score prediction on three 0 so I'm happy with that. But you know, the, Colorado. I mean, they were just so so bad. So bad so that I wish we could have had some subs earlier in the game. Maybe get some minutes yeah. for Bello or Carlton or even Barco coming off an international break. But mm -hmm. Tata is not really a fan of substituting, especially early in a game, but yeah. Atlanta got the win and no one got hurt. So for me, that's the real sticking point. Right. Yeah, I mean, Tata's gonna Tata. I mean, he just, uh, he's going to go with his starting 11 and he's going to play them as long as possible. It's just what he does. And uh, I mean, hopefully it's not to our detriment at any point, but um, I think we know this going in. And, you know, I think we're all, I was pining for a Carlton to come in much sooner a bellow for a McCann at some point as well, because I know he's not going to be able to play three matches in no. seven days. No way. And so at some point he's going to be able to, you know, he's going to have to need to, to sub in guys. But I think the, uh, the mindset maybe just to maybe kind of uh, get in the mind of Tata is maybe that, you know, they hadn't played a game in two weeks essentially. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a perfect time to play the the, you know, the actual starting eleven as many minutes as possible, and then maybe in the midweek game give them more of an early rest. Uh, I think we've seen that happen uh, before, and we've seen like a Jose Martinez not really get mad at being subbed off in a, a midweek game because it's, he's like, okay, I understand. It's yeah, a, well, it's a game at the weekend. He still always gets mad when he gets subbed off. Let's yeah. be real. I mean, unless he scored a hat full of goals, he's not really ever going to be happy. For me, I think another thing was just impressive was again how good Julian Gressel is playing yeah. from like a right wing back spot any side where he's when he's not that you know for this player forward on the right hand side his service is just yeah. incredible putting those both balls those on a plate both those assists he had were absolutely incredible I mean that first goal was just absolutely picture perfect you have LGP playing it out from the back beautiful ball out to the wing mm -hmm. Gressel goes down the wing lays the ball right in perfect and then again going back to that you know Miggy's second goal mm -hmm. Joseph takes that in the other day of the week but he knows his, his man needs some goals so he plays him in, gets the assist, fusion dance, happy days. Yep. I mean, it, it was it was good to see them do that. But I again, not to beat a dead horse, but I agree. I wish we could have seen some more minutes. Maybe that's what we'll get from the San Jose match on Wednesday. Right. This match as a whole, though, I think it's hard for me to take any really big conclusions from it. Again, mm -hmm. just because Colorado were dreadful. Yeah, they, they got their tactics completely wrong where, you know, they had a good healthy possession as mm -hmm. well. And that's where we were so deadly because we were so direct and... Uh, there was a play earlier uh, that Joseph, it was almost the same same play, but uh, it was a matter of Miggy actually being able to put it away. But um, yeah, it, you know, it was, uh, the other one was almost directly at, uh, at Howard. And so, yeah, I mean, but it's one of those, uh, you know, so completely, I think Colorado just got it completely wrong where, uh, why would you come out and play that way against the likes of Atlanta where, uh, you know, you, you just saw DC United 
they did exactly what you needed to do to beat an Atlanta team and sit did. tight, tie at the back, be compact, and try to win on the break. And they definitely did not do that. Yeah. One thing I guess that's a really good positive about this is the fact that Darlington Nagby came in and played mm-hmm. 70 plus minutes and was absolutely incredible. Yeah. Mind you, again, it is Colorado, right. but still, the, he didn't misplace a pass. <laughs> yeah. He made all perfect of his passes. Field. He was perfect. Everything he yeah. did was perfect. And it's like he didn't miss a beat after being out for a very long period of time and was able to come back and get some minutes. I didn't think he'd play as long as he did. Yeah, I think they planned on giving him only about 60 minutes and, uh, you know, it happened the way that it did, yeah. but I mean, maybe he doesn't play as much against against San Jose in the midweek. But mm-hmm. it was great to see him back out there, making those passes, dictating the play, and being back amongst, amongst the guys. You know, it's it's good when you get that player back, and I mm-hmm. think he'll be really key for these next two games coming up, especially with the yeah. Real Salt Lake game on the weekend. No, definitely. I mean, uh, it definitely beefs up our midfield and all the options that we have. But again, yeah, uh, you know. Going into this match, we saw a very big change in tactics from Tata. We went to the 3-5-2 instead, and we saw a Jeff Lorenowitz in the right center back role, which was definitely a bit of a surprise, but also Nagby start for the first time as well, and that was great. Uh, after a while, you know, after such a the, the longest layoff in his career for, uh, injury-wise, and um, I think... You know, maybe it was a, a backdoor way of fitting all the midfielders in without actually having to make that choice of like, okay, you know, this is the one, uh, you are the one that I'm going to choose and drop, uh, you know. I'm just so. not really necessarily convinced of Lorenowitz as a yeah. center back in a back three. Right. I, as much as I, you know, kind of pan Escobar constantly on this show, I would rather him be that right sided center back in a back three than Jeff Lorenowitz and have Lorenowitz in front of him providing that shield because mm-hmm. I think Escobar plays that position better. He's quicker, mm-hmm. he's a better header of the ball. And I think Jeff's much better at reading the game mm-hmm. and breaking up the play and then being that anchor man that, that helps spring that attack forward and links the play to the mm-hmm. midfield. And then we build from there. Because so, yeah, we saw Jeff Lorenowitz got uh, he got turned around time and time again in this match, and it's one of those uh, if you get turned around, you need pace to be able to recover, and he just unfortunately yeah. doesn't have that at this uh, age. And uh, I mean, I think we saw luckily that Nagby was able to recover and uh, intercept some of those plays, especially in the box. He's that, just that too really vulnerable. If, if you're gonna play that back three, he can't be yeah. on the right side. You have to put him yeah. in the middle or something. Otherwise, he's just in way too much space. Right. A lot of the Colorado's chances came on that right side, and I think against a tougher team, we're really susceptible. And it's just, uh, yeah, I don't really want to see him back there again against the, uh, you know, a good team. But um, yeah. I mean, uh, and I, I think there was one, I think, play that uh, I think a lot of people really got upset at at the end of the match where, yeah, I mean, Joseph pretty much gets uh, clattered. Um, yeah, while the defender gets the ball, uh, you know, it's a very, I think, very dark yellow for me, like an orange. Yeah, it's it's tough. I think that tackle is completely unnecessary. It honestly really irritated me, but I don't think I don't think there was any menace in it, which is why he didn't mm-hmm. see red. I think it was just a bad tackle from a player who might not be that talented, and yeah. that's why you ended up with the result you did. That being said, stud showing into the back of his leg. Yeah. I, mean, I, I was painful. not happy about it. Honestly, I didn't want Joseph on the field at that point in time yes. anyway. I, I thought that he should have been anyway. subbed off early anyway, maybe bring on a Romario yeah. Williams. Yeah. But like, yeah, orange. I mean, it's just one of those mm-hmm. one of those hard yellows, could be a red, really depends on the ref that you have and how they see the right. game. Yeah, but the fact is, is that it went to VAR and I guess the, the VAR didn't you know, think it was as well. So I guess there is that double opinion of, okay, it wasn't. But yeah, I, I can see if uh, you know you have that complaint. It's like, yeah, I, I can see it. But uh, you know, it's one of those. It shows that Joseph Martinez is absolutely still playing the full ninety. He's going in. You know, uh, if it's a you know a, a ball that's 50-50, he's still going after it. So. Uh, would I'd it be advised? I prefer he didn't do that at yeah. that point in time. I prefer no. he just kind of stay on the halfway <laughs> line and just relax. Exactly. But, I mean, he's not one to do that. He's the ultimate competitor, which is why we love him so much and is why he's as good as he is. So, But he didn't get hurt. No injuries. 3-0 win. Three points. Got out of dodge. Happy days. Right. Moving on to San Jose. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But uh, just a few quotes or a, a couple quotes from this match. And Tata Martino's decision to not start Ezekiel Barco and how it looked once he came on. He said, I thought his attitude was great when he came on. It was nothing more than a decision not to start him. 
The fact that Colorado plays a high line and is compact, I thought it would be better to start another forward instead of a midfielder to try to take advantage of the wings and get in behind the center backs. I mean, I think, yeah, uh, it's nothing more than that. I think, uh, I mean, Barco has played well since he's come back from the discussions. Uh, I think, yeah. I he's mean, been okay. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, he's not he's not lit the league up or anything like that, but I think he's played well enough for what he's been doing this season. That's like, fair. You know, there's not really. I just get he just frustrates the hell out of me. Sometimes. For sure, for just sure. the endless dribbling into the middle of the pitch and then losing the ball. I could do without every single game. Sure. But, yeah. I mean, I mean, he's also 19, so exactly. I can't really be too upset. And he's really, yeah. you, you can see the talent that he has. Yes. If you, I mean, technically, he is a very sound player. He right. Has, and he, he does create a lot of chances as well yeah. for us. He and, just frustrates the hell out well, of me sometimes, I guess, because I know how good he could be, and when he yeah. just does dumb things, I'm just like, why? Yeah. But uh, I'm sure a lot of people had questions on why he didn't start, and there it is. It wasn't an out. It was like he was out and out being dropped for poor yeah. performance. It wasn't before. It's was just tactics. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so next up is Miguel Miron's uh, quote about Darlington Nagby and how important it was to have him on the field. He said, "Every player is important, but Darlington Nagby is a very special player. We missed him a lot, so I'm glad he was able to get healthy and be back on the field." I think uh, we all saw, yeah, how important he was uh, in this match, and you know, and how we missed him uh, during this time as well. I mean, although Rometty has done a very glowing job, uh, you know, stepping in, but I think it's it's one of those where you could see the control that we had. You could see just where he didn't misplace a pass, and the fact that he was tracking back and able to uh, pair up well with Eric Rometty as well. I think it bodes really, really well for our midfield prospects in the future. Oh, absolutely. And again, to just get into the nitty-gritty stats on it, he played 77 minutes, had 40 touches, completed 33 or 33 passes with three or three long balls completed. That's efficient as it comes. (laughs) I mean, that's a guy who's absolutely feeling himself in midfield. Glad to see him back, really. I mean, he's just a benefit to everyone. He just takes that pressure off because you know that if you need to recycle the ball, Mm -hmm. he's going to be there. His touch is going to be sound, and he's going to get the ball to whoever it is that needs to make a play. All right. But, uh, guys, uh, let's get into the news from this past week. And, yeah, I mean... There's only one thing to start off with, if we're being honest. I think so. I mean, there's all the, the rumors of Tata Martino being linked with said country. And, you know, he was linked with Argentina, with Colombia, with uh, Mexico. I mean, it's just, you know, yes. ridiculous. Uh, yeah, the U.S. as well. I mean, just ridiculous uh, rumors, probably. But uh, Tata Martino kind of reiterated to the press, like, one, he doesn't have an agent. Uh, two, so, like, two, when people are uh, saying, like, oh, blah, 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 we spoke to his agent, blah, 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 it's just patently false. He doesn't have anybody to really even uh, have it as an intermediary. So, you know, if they, you know, didn't talk to him, nothing happened. And um... Kind of reminds <laughs> me of this little anecdote. Back in 2013, Manchester United were trying to sign Ander Herrera. And they were negotiating with representatives from Athletic Bilbao, and there are people in uh, in uh, the Basque Country negotiating for it that had no association with anyone. They were like, "Oh, they're negotiating." It's like no one actually who's involved with anyone is actually doing anything uh, here. Yeah. It was just people just not doing anything correctly. So I mean, maybe people were speaking to someone, but like you said, he doesn't have an agent. So right. unless you're speaking directly to Tata. You're not talking about anything, and as far as we know, the only people that have been talking to him is Atlanta United. Right, exactly, and uh, so he did give that deadline of October 1st to make that decision. Um, Now, I mean, that's coming up pretty quickly, and so, you know, I think if there are already talks, then, you know, there there should be already talks, because, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's coming up soon, and it'd be a worry if uh, that's the deadline and nothing has come about yet. So, you know... My gut feeling on this is that if he set October 1st as a deadline with the mutual extension of his contract, I think he stays at least one more year because I don't think he's going to announce himself leaving in October before the playoffs. Mm -hmm. It's not a smart team move. It's not going to set a mood right because if you know the manager's leaving, maybe it gets you to fight, but maybe it also throws things into confusion for players. Mm -hmm. Who's going where? I think he has one more year here. I think he definitely wants to make sure he wins something here. Mm -hmm. I don't think he wants to leave Mm empty-handed. And with the prospect of the contract, Cap Champions League next year as well. It's another trophy for him to win. I think a third season where he definitely feels that he can win some silverware. If he doesn't, you know, this season, 
I think that's good for Tata. He traditionally doesn't stay anywhere more than two years if you go back and look at his CV. Yeah. So, it's true. you know, but then again, I don't think he's been in a situation like Atlanta United mm -hmm. where he's loved by everyone. See the Tata pin that came out last week, which was yeah. obviously kind of some weird timing, but yeah. everyone loves the guy. He's very gregarious. He loves Atlanta. He gets privacy. He gets respect. And right. also, he gets to do what he wants with this team. Mm -hmm. He's not really going to get that anywhere else. He, apparently, he wanted that with Argentina, but if he's mm -hmm. not talked to anyone, then that's an absolute load of bollocks. So yeah. we'll see what happens. But my gut feeling is, especially with that deadline, is he's going to stay at least one more year, mm -hmm. and that we'll see what happens after that. Right. And, you know, uh, to also reiterate the, you know, all those federations that apparently have contacted Martino, uh, he also. Uh, was quoted uh, as saying he hasn't been re reached out at all uh, in the press by uh, Doug Robertson of the ADAC. That, yeah, I mean, he hasn't been reached out to at all. So, ridiculous, pretty much. So, uh, I think that bodes well for our case, but uh, yeah, deadline is coming up soon, so we'll find out. And with Miguel Almiron's two goals and his assist against Colorado Rapids, he now becomes the fifth player this season to have double-digit goals and assists. It also takes his assist total over the last two seasons up to 26, which is the most in Major League Soccer. Yeah. So for all the complaining that I've been doing and that people have been doing that he hasn't been playing his best, well, I'm an idiot and clearly he is delivering the goods. Yeah, for sure. And um, another uh, really interesting piece of, uh, of stats that came out uh, this week was that uh, on AJC, uh, it pretty much said that Atlanta United has only 1,121 minutes from subs this season. That's the second lowest total in the league, only behind Portland. That's uh, That just shows you, I mean, yeah. Tata, Tata doesn't sub. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I'm shocked we're not the bottom, to be perfectly real. It's true. I feel like he yeah. never brings someone into the 80th every single time, mm -hmm. and it's always into the game, time killing, and then obviously Kevin Kratz has to come on at some point in time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think it's it's also like uh, this season we haven't had as many like uh, you know three game in you know three games in one week type of uh, you know type of things that happen. September so, last year. Yeah, and so September, yeah, we pretty much just uh, yeah for six weeks it was a game every three days. We uh, we definitely played really really well in that time frame, but we were gassed in October, and you could really really see it. And uh, coupled with the Miguel Miron injury, that just pretty much. Uh, sputtered us into the playoffs. So I think if we can at least avoid, you know, so many games in one week, uh, maybe it at least kind of quells that uh, and makes this stat moot. But, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's uh, a case where, yeah, I mean, uh, these guys are taking off a little bit early in the stretch run and we can at least uh, hope that they're you know, nothing happens to him. And some more little interesting stats coming out of that Colorado game. Atlanta's goal difference is now up to plus 26, which is good for sixth best in MLS history. Mind you, last season we finished with plus 30, but also we still have six games to play. We're scoring goals, so that's pretty good. But however, over the two game span that we, well, two game span, two year span we've been in existence, Atlanta is now second all time with a over two year goal difference. Only behind LA Galaxy who had plus 61 in 98-99, way back in MLS 1.0. I think that goal is definitely in reach with these five stripes considering they've also surpassed their points total from all of last season. Mm -hmm. And again, six games to play. They're hitting stride at the right time. Thankfully, we'll see how things go to the rest of the season. Definitely. Uh, and moving on into the injury report, uh, before Monday's training, Martino pretty much said that, yeah, we uh, don't have anybody injured uh, from that match, and so that bodes well for San Jose. Uh, I think mostly that's talking about Jose Martinez was not uh, really uh, spiked too hard, and so that's good. Yeah, but, but things uh, continue <laughs> to say the same with the long-term injuries. Garz is still out, mm -hmm. hopefully hoping for a return by the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Ambrose is out, and Zizzo is still out as well for the yep. extended future with knee injuries. Definitely. And moving on to Atlanta United 2. Atlanta United 2 played Tampa Bay Rowdies to a 1-0 loss, unfortunately, but they looked pretty decent and you know kept a pretty tight game uh, considering the, the aspect of most of the players that are uh, the starters for Atlanta United 2, or at least fringe players, uh, has traveled to uh, you know Colorado and San Jose with the, the first team. And so they didn't, really didn't have a whole lot of uh, players at their disposal, pretty much like the story of the season, season. To be yeah, exactly. honest. But, uh, you know, so at least uh, pretty decent from them. Uh, but, you know, of course, it's what it is. It's a, it's a project and it's uh, one of those you know, they're there to 
uh, really just get the minutes. Yeah, but. and we'll, I think going forward into the future, Atlanta 2 will probably evolve and they'll figure out how they want to balance players going back and forth. And ideally you kind of have, for me at least, you have a group of players that, okay, they're not ready for the first team, but they're doing too good for Academy. Let's put them at USL, get mm -hmm. them their minutes there, consistently play them at a professional level against men. Mm -hmm. Then they have the ability to step up and then go into the first team because they've been getting those consistent minutes at a professional level. But moving on from that, guys, we're going to get into the standings. And honestly, things are looking pretty nice right now. I hated DC two weeks ago, and they did as an absolute solid this yes. past weekend. Mind you, a win wouldn't have been bad, but also could have seen as being matched up with DC going into the playoffs, as some of you definitely pointed out to me on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But I will take the draw because that means Atlanta United are a point ahead of New York Red Bulls with a game in hand, which means we can go four points clear if we win this game against San Jose. Mm -hmm. The key to that is there's a four point gap when we play Red Bull. If we can have that four point gap, we can afford to lose that game. Not saying I want to, but it gives you that little cushion yeah. to winning Supporters totally. Shield and finishing first. And that is big. If you can get a cushion at the end of the season, it gives you that wiggle room. And you never know what can happen, especially with Red Bull, because, well, we don't play the best against them. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, but, uh, you know, Atlanta United won on the road this past match, and they, they now lead uh, the league with nine wins in this season, and uh, on the road anyway. More than we and, have at uh, home. Yeah, more than we have at home. But, uh, you know, we're, we're doing okay at home. It's, it's not the worst. But uh, it's one of those, if we get the 10th, we break that record for away wins in a season. And, uh, you know, that's... Uh, that's that insane. would be 30 points on the road. I just want to point that out. Yeah. That is incredible. And that is the reason why Atlanta, again, passed their, has surpassed their point total from last season with six games to play. Mm -hmm. And why that MLS single season points record haul is in sight for the five stripes right now. Indeed, indeed. And uh, another piece of news, I mean, and you, it's already come out uh, anyway, that, but our uh, our merch has, uh, you know, dropped for the Joseph as the king of uh, MLS, essentially, in terms of single season goal scoring records. And, uh, you know, make sure to get your, uh, you know, anything. It could be a shirt, it could be a hoodie, it could be, um, you know, a tank, anything that you want. We ha we've got it. And so just, uh, you know, find it in the link in the description box below. And, uh, you know, every little bit helps us sustain this channel and, um, you know, we, uh, we really appreciate every single uh, person that buys something. But um, yeah, let's move on into our mailbag <laughs> questions. Uh, you guys send in these questions on Instagram story and uh, keep sending those in and you can get your questions in if uh, you know we uh, it catches our fancy. But first question comes from uh, Domimrian. <laughs> yeah, oh. we're just gonna apologize. We have Definitely. no idea how to pronounce it. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah. But Domiremian, let's just uh, let's just go with that. And uh, he asks, "Do you think Almiron is getting back into the groove of things since his drought?" I'd say so. Yeah, I think he's finally starting to get back. Getting amongst the goals is good. I think Joseph, a, I think he was being unselfish, but B, I think he also knows that if Miggy can get confidence and get back to scoring goals, it makes his job a whole hell of a lot easier as well. So I'm happy to see him finally picking up that form that we know he can, getting those goals, getting those assists, being a danger constantly. And that can only, you know, bode well for Atlanta United going forward and going into the end of the season and in the postseason. Yeah, I think it was just a matter of, uh, of think, you know, seeing the ball hit the back of the net for Miguel Miron. And uh, once he was able to do that in open play, uh, that's really all he needed. And so, you know, this past month he's scored a, you know, a, a few goals already. So that's that's good. It's more than the, the past couple months. So, I mean, definitely it's on the upward trajectory. So, you and know. they weren't from the penalty spot. Like you said, yeah. they're from open play. Yeah. So the man's scoring goals. And again, he's got to have one. a chance to get on Wednesday against San Jose because mm -hmm. they're also terrible. <laughs> Indeed. But uh, next question comes from... Uh, it's a, uh, I think James and then underscore seven. Underscore Why is 10. everyone making complicated usernames <laughs> on Instagram? Just use your name, damn it. Uh, That's what I do, but I'm boring and I don't have a great Instagram because, yeah. well, I'm just bored. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I hope this isn't your password as well because it really looks like one, but uh, he asks, do you think 352 or 4231 will be better for the playoffs? Neither, 433 all the way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it very well could. I mean, it's one of the formations that we have kind of ghostly played this uh, season. I'm going to bang on about it consistently. I'm sorry. It may be annoying, but I just, 
I'm going to stop because I've said too much about it already. You know how I feel about the 4-3-3. I think that's what we should play all the time, uh, but I digress. Yeah, I think against a, uh, you know, a team that is going to play Route 1 or sit back a little bit more, I think a 3-5-2 suits us better. Um, but a 4-2-3-1, I think, though, um, I think generally incorporates most of our attackers. And uh, I, I think we've seen, you know, with, um, you know, that formation pretty much the past month, I think we, you know, we, we did really well with it. But I think the only, uh, you know, maybe matter in which if we face a DC United, maybe we play a 3-5-2 because we did fare a lot better uh, earlier this season with that playing against them like that. So um, it just depends. I mean, it's it's tough. Um, you know, I think it should be a matchup by matchup basis. So uh, next question comes from Oi Gustavo Q. He says, I am a Brazilian fan. Congratulations for the page. It is very good. Let's go Atlanta. Oi, I have Gustavo no Kiel. idea how you found Atlanta yes. United or this page, but thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. It means a lot for real. Wherever you are in Brazil, keep cheering on the five stripes. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. Seriously. Yes. Big ups. Really, 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 really appreciate that. Next question comes from Sammy Norton 99 They ask, one player from Europe that you would bring to Atlanta and reason why try to be realistic, smiley face. Uh, I'm just going to let you take this one because honestly, it's a question we get all the time and it's yeah. hard for me to be A, realistic or B, just not, you know, just not go off into like right. Alice in Wonderland of who I'd love to bring in because right. it's not really our MO. Yeah, it definitely isn't what Atlanta United, uh, the front office does, but you know, let's go down this rabbit hole. Let's do it. And um, you know, we're, we're feeling Let's saucy just throw, today. you know what, realism, let's just get rid of it. Actually yeah. though, we kind of talked about it earlier yeah. and it, it could kind of be plausible. Right, yeah, because with that, you know, uh, the Inter-Miami with Beckham and Antoine Griezmann, the uh, that link where Griezmann pretty much said that he, I'm at one Miami. point, yeah, yeah. I, I would, you know, welcome going to Miami. I, uh, you know, that really kind of got our, our wheels churning in that, yeah, if it was a case of, you know, I could see a kind of Ronaldo coming to MLS at some point with a Beckham, um, you know, at the helm, I, I feel like that's almost a match made in heaven. I mean, it's the United connection, the Madrid connection. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, he probably it, fit in pretty well down there. Yeah, Enjoy Miami showing off his Ronaldo bot on the beaches of Miami. Right. Let's be honest, he loves doing that. Right, and then of course, uh, you know, with that, uh, you know, I think why he went to Juventus to begin with is probably to maybe evade some more of those taxes that, uh, you know, to be got fair, in trouble in Spain. Spain love to tax people. For sure. For sure. <laughs> like, they but, uh, love to do that. Yeah. And but it, Florida. Yeah, exactly. But Florida doesn't have taxes, and so there you go. Well, no income taxes. No income taxes, there you go. And, uh, and so, you know, another person that has been hit with that type of tax evasion type of thing, uh, Lionel Messi. Um, and I think it's this. This is a scenario that I think, you know, is ridiculous, but maybe could happen uh, if, you know, MLS were kind of intelligent about it. So basically, you know, uh, you know, Messi maybe could go to Miami too. I don't, I wouldn't want that, but, you know, it could be a case where uh, whoever the commissioner is at that point, um, you know, it's a kind of, you know, El Clasico 2.0 type of thing where, you know, maybe Messi, if uh, Tata Martino is still here with LA United, we sign Messi and then enter Miami, signs Ronaldo, we have El Clasico 2.0. It'd be ridiculous, but dude, it would be, yeah, all those Messi jerseys alone, alone, it would be ridiculous. Like, that's worth the price alone. Well, now for sure I know one thing I'm gonna do in FIFA this year when I'm like four years in. I'm just gonna bring, you know, Messi to Atlanta, cause why not? I mean, yeah, are we going on the rabbit hole? Yes. yes. So if anyone's <laughs> trying to clip it and be like, these people think Messi's coming, we're just kind of having fun, but yeah. let's be realistic. That'd be crazy. Like, yeah. If Tata's still here and, you know, MLS is something that Messi would want to do, depending on where Ronaldo or Griezmann or any of those other guys are at in the league, I mean, it could be a very attractive proposition for him. We play mm -hmm. a similar style of football that he'd be used to. And even at 35, 
I still think that Messi is going to be pretty damn good considering him and yeah. Ronaldo have been the best two players in the last 30 years. Right. I mean, so, you see what Rooney is doing and he's on like one leg essentially. I would, I would buy a Messi jersey so fast. I, <laughs> I mean, there would be so many red and black Messi shirts everywhere. Mm. It would be incredible. I would love that. But also, for me personally, I would feel so torn because I'm a massive Ronaldo fan. I can't help it. He's one of the reasons why I got into the game. Him running down the wing for Man United. Yeah. I love the guy. I can't help it. I have three different Ronaldo shirts. So, never bought a Madrid one, but I have a Juve, a Portugal, and a Man United one. But I love the guy. But if he's playing for Miami and Messi's playing for us, oh, God, that'd be such like a weird mixture of emotions. Yeah, yeah. But on, on Miami, though, I will say, I think they're going to end up being probably one of United's biggest rivals because I agree. No. they're a club that wants to be run the same way that Atlanta is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Nashville will ever be of that size. I think they might be more of like a Columbus Crew, Portland-type team where mm -hmm. maybe they don't have the finances, but they could be very well organized and surprising people mm -hmm. and be compact. But I think Miami's going to go for it big. I think they want to be one of those big mm -hmm. car I think most players, especially Spanish-speaking players coming from Europe, will want to go there. The weather, the culture, I mean, most of them wouldn't even have to learn English because in Miami, you don't sure. have to speak English to right. go anywhere. So I think they're going to be a big rival. Not to mention, they stole our VP, so they yep. kind of know how to run a team. Exactly. And I think, yeah, they're not going to be shy about shelling out for players as well. And I think, let's be fair, LA United probably aren't going to be too shy either if it came down to it. And, um, you know, if it's one, two of the best teams in the league at that point and they're going head to head and, you know, that's at least three matches because we're in the same conference. I think that's money for this league. You know, it's uh, maybe not the most realistic, but there's a scenario that it could happen. And, you know, why the hell not? It's not the craziest thing I've ever heard. How yeah, about that? For sure. Exactly. Especially, you know. The whole Griezmann being rumored with Inter Miami already, so there you go. I mean, especially if there's still like seven Argentinian players on this team, why would he not? Why would Messi yeah. not want to come? Be like, hey, countrymen, and also yeah. no. Well, actually, let's be fair. <laughs> Messi would be the one person if he ever showed up in Atlanta that he would not be left alone. Like most of the Atlanta Probably. players have the ability to go. I mean, they're they're all recognized. Let's be honest, yeah. but it's that love and that adoration. If Messi ever showed up, there'd be people following him where ever he went probably but i but, cannot yeah. the, the idea of having messi and joseph martinez on the same team assuming joseph would still be here i would have to just change pants constantly to be <laughs> you. like i couldn't even like uh, fifa projects i'm gonna have to do it in fifa and see how it goes and i'm probably go. just gonna beat everyone let's be honest yeah you, you can roster bait there but uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh let's move on to our match preview for wednesday and some of you that may be watching it may have already happened but you know we're getting this out nonetheless so uh we appreciate everybody who's watching and uh you can get both previews uh coming up right now but uh, essentially, uh, Wednesday at 11 p.m. at Avaya Stadium in San Jose, we played the Earthquakes. It's uh, you know their last place, and they're they've worse got worse than Colorado. Yeah, they're worse. Hard to somehow, believe somehow, but you know they uh, they still surprised uh, a top team in FC Dallas their third match ago uh, by winning 4-3. Um, yeah, they've you know. Unfortunately, it lost uh, you know a couple of matches. They but got smoked by Sporting KC. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they lost two one against uh, Vancouver, and then they got smoked five one against Sporting KC. It's one of those you know uh, we should do the business um, as long as we don't take them lightly. We should be able to, but you know as long as we do that, then we should be okay. But I think a good part about this is the fact that the team stayed out west after the yeah. Colorado game. Yeah. They're going to be adjusted to the time, mm -hmm. so jet lag won't be an issue because, honestly, that kind of would concern me if their yeah. bodies are still thinking, it's 11 o'clock and we're playing a soccer match, mm -hmm. but most of them are probably going to bed. So, you know, not ideal, but having stayed out there, having trained out there, they're going to be adjusted. Obviously, it's not great for us back here with, you know, it being a work day and... <laughs> <laughs> Let's be, I think a lot of people will still be up and watch that match, but mm. it's going to be interesting to see who he starts, if he rotates at all, right. and I mean, they should take care of the business, but mm -hmm. you know, it's still a tricky match, and the fact that right. it's all the way out west, and yeah. it's a midweek game. Right, and also, yeah, the Earthquakes just fired their head coach, uh, Michael Starr, and yeah, I mean... Not shocking when you have four wins in the season. Exactly, but uh, I'm surprised that they did it. You know, in this timing, at this point in the season, uh, you know, six games left for them. It's 
so they bring in an interim coach. Uh, that interim coach is Steve Ralston, and uh, you know he's been uh, kind of touted in you know different jobs around the league where he might have taken over, but at least at least he was interviewed, so he's at least pretty highly revered in the league. It might be a situation for him where he's going to get six games to see yeah. if he can keep the job. Right. Because True. at this point, you've got nothing to play for. Mm-hmm. Clearly, this isn't going to, the last head coach isn't going to be the head coach they have going forward. Mm-hmm. So give him six games. See right. what he can do. See if he yeah. can turn some results around. See if he can get some points going down and say, this is your interview. Let's see what you can do if you're the head man. Mm-hmm. So that might be his opportunity to finally get a step in. Unfortunately, it's with a pretty dismal organization, if I have to say. Yeah, probably. But uh, yeah, I mean, but he was the assistant coach there. So at least there's some continuity. And then, you know, Anytime you have an interim coach, you pretty much get to pretty much r- rile up the players and get them to play for you because essentially if you are the coach uh, for the following season, then maybe you get to actually choose the players and whoever has performed for you, then uh, you get the pick of the lot. So uh, this may actually be the best time for them to play us. Uh, they'll be really up for it and that actually kind of doesn't bode the best for us, but I think there's still pretty dismal that, uh, you know, it w- wouldn't really affect us too much, but maybe it does, and I hope it doesn't, but, um, you know, we uh, we have played uh, the Earthquakes one time already, and that was last year on July 4th, and one of the most fun games of the oh, year, yeah. I think. That was a great game. Yeah, and... Uh, Wait, was that the one where Joseph almost burned his face off? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that was yeah that the uh, celebration where he jumped up on the uh, the um, the firebox essentially, and yeah, it's like oh, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> yep, we but, don't uh, have those fireboxes anymore. Yeah, yeah, probably but, uh, for the best for Jesse. Yeah, they're a little further away. Yeah, they're like smoke things now because of the the train thing. And into their statistical leaders, Danny Hoser leads their team with eleven goals, and Chris Wondolowski has five assists for them. I still haven't forgiven him for that miss in the 2014 World Cup. Like, yeah. To be honest, like, he's dead to me for that. He could have beat Belgium. You're right there, and you fluff your lines. Uh, and then you're like, oh, that this is either that, that season or the season after where he, you know, sets or ties the yep. MLS goal scoring. And I'm yep. like, bro, I just needed you to score one. <laughs> that was it. So he falls yeah. into the dead to me category that has Josie Altador and Michael Bradley as well. Although I don't hate him nearly as much because they actually insofar, did decently well that year. Yeah, insofar as he's not a dick and the other two are. I mean, sure. I don't know if you saw, but Michael Bradley got into an argument with Zlatan this past weekend. <laughs> yeah. Zlatan says he has more goals than Michael Bradley has games. Not true, but yeah. I don't care. It was still awesome. And his <laughs> goal was awesome. I will support Zlatan in that argument every single time. <laughs> Piss off Michael Bradley. But uh, yeah, I so. Guess. Yeah, um, that gets us into our uh, prediction of the formation. Um, yeah, it definitely, you know, it could go any which way. Uh, I have no idea. Yeah, Tata Martino doesn't really, you know, rotate a ton, and especially not in the league. And so, you know, maybe if it was a U.S. Open Cup match, maybe we would see more of the kids. But um, I just don't think a lot changes. I think it's pretty much an unchanged formation in terms of 3-5-2, uh, but I think Escobar comes in as a right center back, and uh, you know, I think Larry actually steps in for Rometty in the midfield, and that's the lone change. Nagby stays in as well, and probably won't see as many minutes as well, but he will probably come off much earlier, maybe a half, who yeah. knows. But then you have the natural sub with Rometty coming on to end the game. Yeah. I think it would be a welcome change to see Escobar come back in, get some minutes coming off that injury, and play at the position that I think is his best position, which is right-sided center back in a back three, because it kind of restricts where he can go, mm-hmm. which, in my opinion, is the best thing, because when he's given that license to go, well, he's never in the right place after that. But he can win headers. You know that they're going to have to be a bit more direct because they're not as good. Mm-hmm. So I think that's going to be a good change. And seeing Jeff slide back in the midfield, I think that's where he's at his best. And mm-hmm. he makes it land a tick when it comes to breaking up the play and getting the attack going again. Mm-hmm. So I think that's probably, I would agree with you on where we go formation-wise for that one. Yeah. And uh, getting into our predicted score, um, what do you think, man? I'm just going to get 3-0 again. They're yeah, terrible. Sure. I think even if we rotate a little bit, we should absolutely take care of business Mm. with the new coach bump or not they're not good i mean when you have four wins on the season i I still yeah three no draw the worst case scenario Mm. but atlanta would get some sort of points and if they draw well that's bad news for al salt lake on the weekend definitely but uh i think it's a 4-1 win uh yeah I, i think you know 
if they scored against a really tough KC side, I mean, it, it could be a case where, yeah, we're probably going to concede Chip one as one. well. Yeah. I'd but, like to see Joseph get back on the score sheet. I feel yeah. like it's been a while. It's been, yeah. it's been like almost a month, and that's kind of weird. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, he's got to add on to that goal tally, get to the 35, like I said a few months back, so it would be genius. Right, indeed, indeed. Uh, let us know what your... Uh, also, you know, um, not just lineup prediction, but your score prediction for this match is. But uh, we're going to move on into our second match preview of uh, this week. And that's against Rail Salt Lake at Mercedes-Benz Stadium at 7 p.m. on Saturday. And um, It's a big one. Yeah, it's a big one because, yeah, we open up to the, the full stadium. So it could, you know, break the record again. Hopefully we do. That'd be fantastic. I want to see the roof open if it's a bit of a cooler evening. If yeah, it's like in the 80s, <laughs> that would be pretty awesome because the sun yeah. will already be on the west mm -hmm. side of the stadium. It's not going to be super hot. Mm -hmm. Have the roof open for the whole 70K like we had against Orlando last year. That was dope. Yep. I mean, we're getting into fall. It's still warm right now, yeah. but I think that would be awesome. I'd love to see it. Full house, roof open. Let's take it to RSL. Right. It's going to be a good game. They're yeah. playing pretty good stuff. Yeah, they scored uh, six goals in back-to-back -back games a couple weeks back. It's, they're, they're very, very tough, uh, and they're all the way up to fourth in the Western Conference. Um, yeah, this is going to be one of those, uh, we're getting the best of RSL, you know, at their point in time. And so uh, that almost always happens, it seems. Yeah, you know, where we play the teams team, when they're yeah. in their best form, and afterwards yeah. <laughs> they either become crap, or they just start drawing, or whatever yeah. it is. They save their best for Atlanta United. Exactly. But I guess when you're top of the table, you're going to get everyone's best shot. Indeed, indeed. But uh, our previous matchup against them, when we met them at their stadium, we won 3-1 in 2017. Basket but, uh, on the goal, on the yeah, goal scoring sheet at the end of the game. That was his debut. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so it was one of those games where, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think we set up well against them. But maybe in this match, Maybe it might not be as good of a matchup this season because uh, they're. It seems like they're type of that. They're that type of team where uh, they have a striker that um, you know he's that target forward and he lays off a lot of balls to the midfielders and that's kind of uh, you know it shows in their statistical leaders in that uh, basically they have two midfielders that are leading their team in goals. Um, that's Demir Krylik. That's at 11 goals, and Albert Rusnak with 10 goals, who's been scoring Galassos, uh, yeah. you know, week in, week out with uh, winning MLS goal of the weeks and stuff like that. But their uh, main assist leader is Jefferson Savarino, who's their target forward with 10. And so I think it definitely, um, you know, with a target forward like that playing against a, uh, you know, we're not the tallest side. We don't do the best against a Route 1 type of team. Uh, it doesn't really bode the best, but I think it's, uh, it's, I think it's a little worrisome. Yeah, I think it's going to be a tough match. I think yeah. that formation-wise, it'll be interesting with how Tata approaches it. Mm -hmm. I mean, with it being at home, with it being a full house, the impetus will be on Atlanta United to attack them. I think that with the way that they play, I think, you know, Ralph Salt Lake will be compact and they'll look for that out ball to their striker for him to knock down. That being said, it's harder to play route one when you're constantly pinned. Mm -hmm. So if you can push the, the wings, the wingers back, it's hard for them to get those midfielders yep. up for that knockdown to be effective. Sure. So if Atlanta can pin them back, I think they'll be in good shape. Mm -hmm. It's when, you know, Ralph Salt Lake get the ball, when they have time, when they have that right. possession and what they do. That's when Atlanta are going to have to be mm -hmm. very, very careful because they're dangerous mm -hmm. and we're not the most physical side in the league. You mm -hmm. know, we're more of a finesse speed type team. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what they do with that. I think it's tricky. I still think Atlanta United should win this game, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a very good test of where they are right now in the season, mm -hmm. especially after playing two games where you definitely should win mm -hmm. against Colorado, against uh, San Jose and even coming off of the game against DC a couple weeks back where they're not the strongest team in the league They're playing well, but this is gonna be a big one for Atlanta United as far as where they are against top side teams that play physical That gets us into our formation predictions for this match and yeah, I mean it's Against RSL who have that target forward. I don't think we need a three in the back uh, I mean that extra center back really isn't gonna be doing too much He's not gonna know who to mark maybe at that point uh, so I think a four in the back, so it's a four, two, three, one. Uh, I think Escobar comes in as that right back, um, maybe to your dismay. Um, and Larry Nagby in midfield. Um, and I think Barco comes in at left wing and, you know, all the other usual suspects. So 
I think the worst part about that, or the hardest part about that for me, is that involves Gressel being dropped. And I think right yeah. now, behind Joseph Martinez and Miguel Almiron, he's the most undroppable person in this team. I agree. Yeah. He plays so well consistently. He offers you so much from the right hand side. I agree. Three at the back doesn't make sense tactically against a team that's going to play with one striker up front, especially in a target man role. You just have an extra guy around. You'd rather have that guy in attacker in midfield. I think that Escobar right back in that sense makes perfect sense because he's a good header of the ball. Mm -hmm. My issue is, especially at home, when I think we're going to be attacking a lot, I don't think he's going to be in position to make those headers because he's going to be out to see attacking. And if we're attacking them, I would rather Gressel start at right back at mm -hmm. home where I know he's going to track back. He's going to have cover from Tito as well, who constantly tracks back. It gives you more attacking going down that right-hand side. He's going to be putting those balls into the box, onto the heads of Joseph Martinez, or mm -hmm. on the floor to guys like Miggy or Tito. Mm -hmm. He offers you so much more going forward because he can cut inside. He can go down the byline. Mm -hmm. Anything he does, he has the technical ability in attack to do it and the work rate to defend. He might not be as good in the air, but I think if we can pin RSL back, it gives... United more of a chance to contain them and hold them because they can't play that route one knockdown stuff if their midfielders are back defending. Mm -hmm. So I would go for Gressel at right back, Tito up top, and then having uh, Barco come in in the 4-2-3-1. Personally, I'd rather play a 4-3-3, but that's not going to happen, so I'm just going to quit turning on about it. Although if it did, I would just be so excited and be like, we're absolutely going to win this game by a bunch of goals now. Yeah. But I, I just I just don't see any scenario where you can drop Gressel. I think uh -huh. in that system, if you start Gressel, you can bring Escobar on later on, put Gressel up top for Tito because that guy always runs himself into the ground. Uh -huh. Then, mm -hmm. if you're defending a lead, you have that defensive aspect of Escobar being able to head those balls back. You're mm -hmm. defending a little bit more, so maybe, just maybe, he's under the instructions of don't bomb forward in the 90th minute, and then Atlanta can dig that out. Yeah. That's it's probably just, not gonna I, be I just, structure for Tata. I think, I think the one good thing is is that Tata has options. So mm -hmm. if he feels that he wants to attack them, he can play one way. If he wants to be more defensive, he can play another way. Mm -hmm. Now that your midfield's fit again, does he play Rometty? Does he play Nagby? Does he play Larry? Who does he play where? Yeah. He has so those options. options. And then yeah. if if Rometty doesn't start or if Escobar doesn't start, he has his options off the bench. Mm -hmm. I just can't drop Gressel right now. He has 12 assists okay. in the season. Mm -hmm. He works so hard, especially at home where you want to be more enterprising. You want to be more attacking. Mm -hmm. I start him at right back because I think he can play there. We'll, we'll see what top five makes. But yeah. I want to go for it. I want to pin them back. In my opinion, they can't do anything if we have them pinned in their own 18-yard box. Let's see what we can do with that. Yeah. And I think also to uh, reiterate why maybe a Gressel uh, sits for this game, but also, I mean, he'll be one of the first people off the bench. Um, I think with uh, that wing back role, you're going up and down, you know, a lot. And so I think uh, a rest for that type of, uh, you know, play during the week is good. I, I think, um, you know, it, it bodes better maybe to have more energy coming off the bench. And especially Barco, probably not. Uh, starting, uh, you know, on Saturday and Wednesday, he will be very, very fresh for Saturday. So, you know, maybe there's uh, that combination that is the, the winning formula. But, you know, that gets us into our predictions for the score. And what do you think? I think it's going to be 3-2. Um, I think that Atlanta United are going to score goals. I also think Atlanta United are going to concede goals just because... RSL are tricky customers. Yep. They've been scoring goals against pretty much everyone yeah. they've been playing recently. Even if we're at home in front of 70,000, I still think that they're going to get asked. I think it's just be an open attacking game. I still think that 3-2 might look closer than the final outcome on the field may have been. Mm. But I think it's going to be a very good game. But I think mm. Atlanta had to get the three points. Yeah. Uh, I unfortunately think it's going to be a 3-3 draw. I agree that there's going to be a bunch of goals. Uh, because, I mean, yeah, we're both very high scoring sides. And so, uh, you know, it's going to be a very open game, I feel like. And, um, you know, after, you know, the, the first initial goals, it's just going to be back and forth, back and forth. And, um, you know, it'll make for a very entertaining game. But it might be shades of Orlando City last year, where it's just like whoever scores first is just like, come back, come back, come back. I honestly so. think, though, in a sense that it's not, not saying that every game is a must win game, mm -hmm. but. This game is the, the the San Jose game and the RSL game are must win games yeah. because in my opinion they have to maintain that four point gap to Red Bull unless of course we get lucky and Red Bull drop points between now and then mm -hmm. you have to go into that Red Bull match with that four points yeah. with that cushion to give you that out just in case you don't get the result against mm -hmm. them because let's be realistic 
we don't play well against them, and yeah. I'm not confident going up there and getting a result, mm-hmm. especially when Red Bull are trying to win something. Yeah. So, and it's, let's also be realistic. At home, we haven't been super yeah. fantastic against uh, sides, and so it's. I, I think, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we ha- we I, I want the, the win, of course, but you know, will we get it? I'm a little weary. I think it'll be a very frustrating result if Atlanta don't win again against this tough side. Uh, yeah. I think it'll be very unconvincing. I think the fans would have a right to be frustrated with that result. Mm-hmm. Even though, again, RSL are a good team, mm-hmm. it's getting to the point, though, where if you draw every single time you play a big team at home, mm-hmm. what's the point of playing a big team at home if you can't get the three points? You're wasting your home foot advantage. You're wasting the five-stripe faithful. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are going to be 70,000 people. It's going to be packed. They're going to be mm-hmm. roaring on for that team to win. Mm-hmm. And if they drop points again in front of that, it'll be a very frustrating result for those people to, to, to swallow that pill. And mm-hmm. honestly, as good as they have been on the road, Atlanta have been disappointing at home on, on, on okay. the rest of the season. Yeah. So I think it's a must-win game. I, and I got faith in them. I think they're going to get the result. Yep. But yep. taking it from that, you know, cheer things up a bit. We're going to get into our question of the day. With our whole who would come from Europe, our little messy take from earlier, we kind of already went down the rabbit hole. So I'm curious to see what you guys have to think. If you could sign any player from Europe, and you can be realistic, you don't have to be. Who would you sign? Down in the comments below, and honestly, I'm really looking forward to what you guys have to say. Yeah, I think it's going to be a fun time in these comments, but uh, the, guys, that's it for us today. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, share this video because it really does help us a lot and smash that like button for us. And for Tanner McLeod, I'm AJ. Thank you guys so much for watching.